chance to eat because I was busy getting ready and getting things all set up for this evening's presentation. But are, have you been learning, has anyone learned anything new during this seminar? Would you put your hands there? If you have learned something new during this seminar, hey, praise God. Amen. You know, I don't get paid extra for you learning something new, but I believe the power of the Holy Spirit is available. And the, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would guide us into what? All truth. None of us have all the truth. You know, we're just all students of God's Word, and we're all learning together. Some of us may know a little bit more than other people, but we're all learning. So I'm so thankful that you're here again tonight to learn from God's Word. So last night was kind of a heavy message. It, it may have been a, a shock to some of you to, to learn how Satan used and is using a system to try and deceive individuals and that for a huge period of time, more than 1,200 years, 1,260 years to be exactly, Satan used a system to suppress truth and to shut the light of God's word, shut it away from the common person and so it that period of time is called the dark ages and it's called the dark ages for a very good reason well tonight our presentation is going to be well we got to go through the drill again when I when I ask you a question I want you to respond is that all right this is more like a class and uh, so it's okay when I ask you something to respond back and when I make a point it is quite okay to say you're going to have to do better than that or it's going to be a long night tonight. When I make a point and you know that it's true from God's word, you say, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. The 2300 year prophecy. Now, this is the longest prophecy in scripture. The longest prophecy. And it came from Daniel chapter 8, Daniel's chapters 7, 8, and 9, we've been going over. We went over the 70-week prophecy where the nation of Israel was given a time of probation to make an end of sins, basically to, to amend their ways of following after foreign gods and to, to be faithful to God and that God promised to bless them and do amazing things through them if they would be faithful. And of course the sad commentary is that they were not faithful to that, to that time period, to the probationary period that they were given. And we then looked at the 1260 day or 1260 year prophecy, we went over that last night and tonight we're going to do the 2300 year prophecy. But we need to do some recap from last night, is that okay? Because we're going to do some recap tonight and we're going to enlarge upon what we learned last evening. And I hope you stay with me. I hope that you brought your thinking caps with you this evening. And if possible, even to make notes. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel had a vision. And in this vision, he saw four beasts coming up out of the sea. Four beasts. And we discovered last night that a beast in Bible prophecy is what? It represents that Bible prophecy is very symbolic. And so we must, if we're going to understand the prophecy, then we must understand the symbols and, and the meanings that attach to them. A beast in Bible prophecy represents a kingdom, nation, or empire. We have Daniel chapter 7, 17 and 7, 23, which say that so very clearly Daniel chapter 7 and verse 23 thus he said this is the angel speaking to Daniel thus he said the fourth beast shall be a what a fourth kingdom on earth which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth trample it and break it in pieces now we discovered last evening who that beast was does anyone remember who that that terrible beast was represented the Roman Empire. These four beasts that Daniel saw in Daniel chapter 7, we discovered last evening, represented Babylon, first of all, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, and then finally Rome. This is the beast that trampled and crushed everything in its path. It was such a horrible beast that Daniel didn't even know what to call it. 
But the dragon, that is Satan, used each of these kingdoms represented by these beast powers to oppress God's people. Now, God allowed it to happen. Now, tell me, why did God allow these kingdoms to oppress his, his people, his chosen ones? Why did he do it? It was a form of tough love. Remember we talked about tough love last night that even as a parent you understand that when you have exhausted your, your ability to extend mercy and grace to your child then uh, you have to do something else. Someone said something to me last night and it really stuck with me. He said, you know, he said, uh, you know when, you're, when you're a parent he said you should give your kids pats on the back when they do stuff right and if they do things wrong you just need to pat them a little lower. Do you understand what that is? That, that is called tough love. And God, in his, in his love for his people, in, in an effort to try to wake them up, allowed bad things to happen to them. But Satan was using these, these different kingdoms to oppress God's people. Notice Babylon destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, Medo-Persia. Remember the death decree that was issued when Queen Esther was there uh, with Artaxerxes, the king. Greece, Antiochus, Epiphanes defiled the temple with Greece. And in Rome, they destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. And they did other things. As a matter of fact, in Rome, they destroyed the earthly temple. It was Roman soldiers that nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. So Rome had a, a huge part to play in oppressing God's people, in opposing God. They attacked the early church. And we saw that last night, that Christians were persecuted. They could not stop the daily power of the church. Notice what it says here in Acts chapter 2. It says, so continuing daily. Now this is talking about the New Testament church. The disciples and, and those people who joined the church after Jesus went back to heaven. It says, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they, that is the church, ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church, what? Daily, those who were being saved. The church was going forward by leaps and bounds, even though it was met with very fierce persecution, opposition. And so Satan decided that the way to stamp out the early church was to persecute the church. And so he incited kings and nations. He incited them to persecute the Christians. And there was a, a terrible time of persecution, particularly during the first and second centuries A.D. The, the persecution was horrible. But it says that the blood of the martyrs was seed. In other words, every time a Christian gave his life or her life for their faith, there were scores of individuals who, witnessing that kind of faith, said, that's the kind of faith I want. I, wa I want to feel that convicted. I want to be that committed to a cause that I would be willing to give my life. And so every time a Christian was killed, there were scores of individuals who would gladly step up and take the place of the one who was being executed. And so Satan quickly figured out that he could not stop the advance of the New Testament church through persecution. And so he decided to change tactics. He decided that if you can't beat them, then join them. And that is exactly what Satan did. He joined the church, and through Constantine, the church removed their trust from Jesus, their high priest, and placed it in an emperor instead. Just as ancient Israel had rejected Samuel the priest, and they wanted for themselves a king just like the, all, all the other nations around them. Notice what... Daniel says was going to happen through the very at the very end of the Roman Empire there was going to arise another power we saw that this great terrible beast had horns growing out of its head and Daniel noticed that there was this horn that was different than the other ones he says I was considering the horns and there was another horn a little one coming up among them that is the other horns notice what he says in Daniel chapter 8 about this same horn that was growing out of the beast and out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south toward the east toward the glorious land and it grew up notice to the host of heaven and it cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground and did what 
trampled them, persecution. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. This is a reference to Jesus Christ. And by him, that is this little horn power, by him the daily, it says sacrifices were taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Well, I told you last night that that word sacrifices in my New King James Version, and maybe you have a modern translation, it actually is italicized, which means that word was supplied. It was not in the original text. The word sacrifice is italicized, which means it was given there by the translator. And the translator is not trying to deceive. The translator was trying to make the text more readable. And they felt like, well, they were missing a word. So they're obviously talking about sacrifice. So it was interpreted as daily sacrifice. But this word daily is the Hebrew word tamid, which means daily or continual or perpetual, signifying that Satan was going to attack the church on two levels. He was going to attack the church on a personal level, on an individual level. And what he was going to do, he was going to attack the daily, continual, perpetual work of the Holy Spirit on individual hearts. And so Satan attacked individuals to try and displace the continual presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you and I don't have the presence of the Holy Spirit, according to Romans chapter 8, if we're not spirit-led, then we're not legitimately part of God's family. Satan knows that, and so he attacked individuals trying to displace the work of the Holy Spirit, but he also attacked it on a corporate level, and he attacked the daily, continual, perpetual work of the church. And he didn't do it from without, he did it from within. You saw this slide last night, and this is, again, just by way of review before we continue our discussion of prophecy. But Satan used literal kingdoms to attempt to stop the advance of literal Israel and the earthly, the literal earthly temple in the Old Testament. And so we have the earth, earthly temple and literal Israel being opposed by all these foreign nations, and so Daniel receives this 70-week prophecy, and he says it's going to go all the way to Messiah the Prince. But when Jesus came, there was a change in emphasis. The emphasis now was not on an earthly temple and literal Israel. The emphasis at the cross was on the heavenly temple, and it was on God's spiritual Israel. God, and so Satan uses a spiritual kingdom, which is told us in Bible prophecy, Daniel chapter 7, 8, and 9. He uses a spiritual kingdom to attempt to stop the advance of spiritual Israel. And he is there to oppose the work that is being done in the heavenly sanctuary. If this makes sense, please say amen. We went over this last night. Daniel continues to tell us about this power that was going to arise. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to do what? Change times and law. Satan was going to preempt God. God Satan was going to take on through this visible power on earth he was going to take away the prerogatives of God he was going to change God's law he was going to change the times that God had set up Daniel 8 12 says and he this little horn power cast truth down to the ground he did all this and did what prospered prospered of course the apostle Paul wrote about this in second Thessalonians he says look this this beast power is is going to do tremendously bad things he's going to exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God in other words Satan has now infiltrated the church and he is going to put his own person as head of the church and he's going to do it under the guise of of, of paying homage to God and honoring God now we know that Satan tactic what is Satan's tactic what does he what does he want to do more than anything what is the tactic that he uses to try and keep people from experiencing salvation in a relationship with God he does what that was weak he does what that's the right answer he deceives that is his weapon of choice and Satan is in the business of deceiving individuals 
And he is really doing a good job because of many individuals believing that they're following God or following a system where Satan is sitting at the head. But there is mercy. Can you say amen? There is mercy. God has not cast off his people. God is extending mercy. That's the message of the mercy seat in heaven. Notice this in Exodus 20, the giving of the law, God says it right in the middle of it, showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. And again, I'm making the point again tonight that Satan was not cast out of heaven because he broke God's law. Satan was cast out of heaven because he refused God's mercy. There's, a, there's, there's nothing worse than refusing mercy when it is, is extended. Can you say amen to that? We need God's mercy. I'm so thankful that we're under God's mercy tonight. Notice what the wise man Solomon said. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have what? So if we want mercy, what, what, what must we do according to the wise man? What do we have to do? We have to not cover up our sin. We have to what? confess and forsake them and that's what God is asking us to do to confess and forsake happy is the man who's always reverent but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity that's exactly what Satan did he hardened his heart toward God and he fell into calamity but he's not giving up so this system that Satan put into power was was a system that rejects the mercy of God and mercy rejected leaves only what option for God? Nothing more than judgment. Nothing more than judgment. Now we have been studying the sanctuary night after night and we've been looking at the sanctuary. We've been understanding exactly how the sanctuary is a tool that God is using to teach us about the way in which he saves us. Thy way, O God, is what? In the sanctuary. The symbolism is is amazing. But there is a counterfeit way. In Proverbs, the wise man talks about it. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of what? It's the way of death. You know, the the message out there in the world is follow your heart. But I'm here to tell you tonight, and you know this, we cannot follow our hearts because our hearts are deceitful and wicked That is what the prophet tells us. We cannot trust our hearts. So we have to trust God's way, that way that's in the sanctuary. Well, this power that Satan set up, it took away the daily sacrifice. It took away the continual presence represented by the Ark of the Covenant. This power that Satan sets up, it casts truth to the ground. It doesn't want God's truth. It wants its own truth. This power that Satan set up, it is wearing out the saints of the Most High. In other words, it is a persecuting power. Not only that, but this power that Satan has set up and is working through, it shows himself that he is God. He's put himself in place of God. We found last night that the Antichrist, that that term, Antichrist, doesn't mean against Christ. It means in place of Christ. Christ and that is exactly what Satan has done in this power this power will think to change times and laws and there during the 1260 years he's going to do all this and he's going to prosper so the prophecy said notice we found out this power is going to last for how long don't go to sleep on me now this power is going to last for how long 1260 years we found that out from the prophecy in Daniel 7 25 a time 360 times two two of those 720 and a half a time 180 all added together equal 1260 this is how long this power was going to reign supreme notice this Adam Clark the Methodist in prophetic language a time signifies a year and prophetic year has a year for each day. We, we learned that just a couple of nights ago, right? And we've been applying this, uh, this method of interpreting uh, Bible prophecy, a day for a year. So he says three years and a half, a day standing for a year, will amount to 1,260 years. Well, there's a, also another one, Dr. Henry Guinness, who also 
understood this, and we're talking hundreds of years ago, the 70 weeks of Daniel or 490 days to the Messiah were fulfilled as 490 years. That is, they were fulfilled on the year-day scale. On this scale, the 42 months, that's just 42 times 30, that's 1260. That is exactly how it refers to the time period that this power would exist in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapters 11, 12, and 13. It says on this scale, the 42 months, referring to the same time period, or 1260 days are 1260 years. Well, this power would be an attack on the mercy of God. This power would take the sacrifice of Christ and replace it by indulgences. We talked about that last night. Remember that? Where the church actually said, you know, uh, we, we can offer forgiveness and we, not only can we offer forgiveness, but we can be, we can give you forensic forgiveness. You know what that means? Oh, we can give you forgiveness for something that you haven't even done yet. And this was a great way to raise money that the church needed in order to build itself beautiful buildings, beautiful cathedrals, and it worked awfully well. You could just go out and buy an indulgence. You know, they kind of had problems because a person would say, you know, I want to go out and steal something. And so they would pay for an indulgence. They would go and steal something. And so when the, the civil power in town tried to prosecute, they would say, hey, I've already been forgiven. I've got a piece of paper from from the Catholic Church it says I'm good to go so it created huge huge problems the sacrifice of Christ which was designed so that your sins and mine could be forgiven were replaced by indulgences the baptism was cast down it was replaced by infant sprinkling we understood that baptism is something that you must have information about you must you you must be old enough mature enough to understand what type of commitment you're making in baptism and, and so then you must be baptized according to the way Jesus was baptized. And that was by immersion. But now the church says, oh, no, you don't do that. We'll just take care of it when the person is, is an infant. You know, we'll force salvation on them against, you know, despite their power of choice. So this power cast the truth of baptism down, replaced it by infant sprinkling. But it also cast down the word of God. It was replaced by church traditions. So many ways. Notice this. We looked at this last evening. This is from their own writings. We prohibit also that the laity should not be permitted to have the books of the Old and New Testament. We most strictly forbid their having any translation of these books. The church said that common people could not even understand the Bible. If you wanted to know what the Bible said, or if you had some theological question, then you had to go visit your local priest. If there was a Bible in town at all, it was probably chained to the wall of the monastery or the, the church. The Council of Tarragona said, No one may possess the books of the Old and New Testaments, and if anyone possesses them, he must turn them in over to the local bishop within eight days, so that they may be what? may be burned this is what happened people who were caught with a just a scrap of the new testament or some other portion of scripture they were under they were under severe penalty and if they didn't confess if they didn't thoroughly repent and and show their fidelity to the mother church then they were executed it was a horrible thing so the sacrifice of Christ was thrown down. Baptism was. The word of God was thrown down. Christ's mediation was cast down. It was replaced by confession to priests. They said, unless you go to the priest, unless you confess your sins to the priest, you have no forgiveness. Notice this. We looked at it last night. The poor sinner kneels at his confessor's feet. He knows that he is not speaking to an ordinary man, but to another Christ. He hears the words, I absolve thy sins, and the hideous load of his sins drops from his soul forever. And that is still being taught even today. You'd have no forgiveness. But Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In 1 John 1 9, it says, If we confess our sins directly to Jesus, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to do what? Forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so the light of the church was cast down and replaced by the dark ages indeed it was a very dark time on this earth during that time people lived in fear and people were oppressed people didn't have the light of God's word 
It was indeed a dark age. This power that Satan worked through was a persecuting power. Notice this from a very well-known historical source, that the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. It is impossible to form a complete conception of the multitude of her victims, and it is quite certain that no powers of imagination can adequately realize their sufferings. It is estimated that more than 50 million individuals lost their lives during the Dark Ages at the hands of this persecuting power. So all these things happen, but the law of God was cast down as well. Something that is so central to the law of God, something as God telling us what he expects from us in terms of worship was replaced by the traditions of the church. Daniel was told this in prophecy. He, this power, shall think to change. Notice change times and laws. And notice this is from their own writings. The Pope has the power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. And it says here in Isaiah that the earth is defiled under the inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws. They've changed, notice, the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. When we willingly and openly break God's commandments, there, there are consequences because God's commandments are meant to, they're meant to preserve, they're meant to protect relationships. It's a law of love. And all the evil that is happening in the world tonight can be traced back to individuals who are loveless they have no love of God in their hearts we see that over and over and over again the Catholic Church for over 1,000 years before the evident existence of a Protestant by virtue virtue of her divine mission changed the day from Saturday to Sunday this is what happened the prophecy was fulfilled precisely the Bible says, remember to keep thou the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, no, by my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Again, a quote from a very well-known and respected Catholic theologian. Notice the claims here about the Pope and God. The Pope and God are the same, so he has, that is the Pope, has all the power in heaven and earth. Notice again, the Pope takes the place of Jesus Christ on earth by divine right. The Pope has supreme and full power and faith and morals over each and every pastor and his flock. He is a true vicar, the head of the entire church, the father and teacher of all Christians. He is the infallible. Notice that. Who alone is an is there any man that you can say is infallible? Really? Any person who's had children knows that there's no such thing as an infallible person. Can you say amen to that? But here, they claim that the Pope is an infallible ruler, the founder of dogmas, the author of, and the judge of councils, the universal ruler of truth, the arbiter of the world, the supreme judge. Notice that, supreme judge of heaven and earth, the judge of all being judged by no one. The Pope is God himself on earth. That is a very bold claim. And I share this with you again tonight by review, and I want to emphasize that I am not condemning individuals. And, and all that we are presenting here is not a condemnation of individuals. It's nothing more than a revelation of what has happened. But what, we're, what is being condemned here is a system that Satan is working behind. The system is Satan's system. But there are many individuals who are part of this, this church who are following all the light that they have received. I, I know many uh, wonderful Christians within the Catholic Church, and perhaps you do. Maybe you even have family members. Maybe you have been part of that church, and so I'm not... I'm not condemning people here because God loves people. 
But God is giving us the light of prophecy so that we can have information, so that we can know what truth is. It says in Psalms, But the path of the just is as the shining light, which shineth more and more unto the perfect day. In other words, God is shining light into our path. But God expects us to follow in that light. Can you say amen to that? God doesn't reveal truth to us and then just give us an option as to whether or not we will accept it. Certainly, he honors our choice, but there are consequences to not following the truth. Revelation 13, 18. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. We went over this last evening. We applied the, the Roman numerals. I mean... The prophecy and the title of the Pope were written in Latin, and so we must use the Latin or the Roman numerals. And when we do that, we come out and find out that the, the title of the Pope calculates to 666. It's just another way of identifying. It's, it's kind of like putting the underscore so that we can know for sure that we have the correct identification of what Daniel was shown in Bible prophecy. This is the title of the Pope, Vicar of Christ, and prize is supreme and universal primacy, both honor and jurisdiction over the Church of Christ. This vicar means substitute in place of, and that's why we get this term, anti, the Antichrist, but it doesn't mean it against Christ. It actually means in place of Christ. And so this power was going to rule for a period of 1260 years. It's called the Dark Ages. Now, this power began in 538 A.D., we know that, because that is exactly when the Catholic Church had supreme power bestowed upon them, and there was no other supreme power around. It started in 538, and so if we apply the 1260-year prophecy, it takes us to 1798. We found last night that in 1798, what happened? General Berthier, one of, one of the generals of... I can't even say his name now. Uh, Napoleon, thank you very much. My mind just went blank there. One of Napoleon's generals, General Berthier, marched into Rome under orders and took the Pope captive. And there, when he was taken captive, they took away all the civil authority of the Catholic Church, seized most of their property. The Pope died in captivity. And so the power, the, the supreme power of the Catholic Church came in in 1798 well now we're going to move ahead and we're going to look at Daniel chapter 8 are you ready for some new prophecy tonight come on you guys look a little more excited maybe I should turn down the heat in here boy it's, it feels awfully warm in here tonight doesn't it maybe it's because I'm, I'm getting excited about what we're about to go over I hope that you're excited too Daniel chapter 8 notice what Daniel is shown in prophecy in, in chapter 8. It says, Then I lifted my eyes and saw, this is Daniel speaking, I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram, which had what? Two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher one came up, what? Last. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. So Daniel sees this ram rising up out, and, and he sees that this ram is doing some things. He sees the horns. He's noticing all these details. But then notice what it says. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. So there's going to be a showdown. Well, we already have found out that a beast in Bible prophecy represents a, a nation or kingdom. And so we already, have, we already have some information. Now, we also looked at horns. It says, now the, the male goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken off. And in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. And so now we have the basic outline of this prophecy, but what does it all mean? Well, in Bible prophecy, we discovered last night that a horn in Bible prophecy represents what? 
power, strength, authority, or a king. And I've given you some text there. Now, how many of you got the handout last night that had the, the symbols of Bible prophecy on it? You should make sure that you get one of those. It's a, it's a great tool to assist you in your study of Bible prophecy. It will be certainly useful in the study of the book of Daniel and also in the book of Revelation. So make sure that you get one of those. If you, for chance, did not get one and they don't seem to have one, you come see me and I will make sure that you get one. Bible prophecy, and Bible prophecy horns equal power, strength, authority, or a king. Now notice this. The Bible interprets itself. Can you say amen to that? It's not my opinion. You didn't come here to hear my opinion because my opinion is, what does someone say? My opinion and, and a dollar or so will buy you a cup of coffee someplace. That, that was the old saying. Of course, now people go to Starbucks and I'd have to say my opinion has to be worth $6 because it costs that at Starbucks, I hear. Notice this, the ram which you saw having two horns, they are the kings of what? Media and Persia. And the male goat is the what? Kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the what? Isn't that great? We have just seen right here an interpretation of Bible prophecy. And as a matter of fact, if you go back to Daniel chapter 8, actually if you look in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 16, it will tell you who was giving the interpretation of this Bible prophecy. Do you know who it was? Okay, I'll give you 30 seconds to figure it out. If you go to Daniel chapter 8 and look in verse 16, it will say who gave this interpretation. Ah, someone has already said it. It is what? The angel Gabriel. And there's some speculation, some ideas that Gabriel might have been one of the two covering cherubs in heaven, one of which was Lucifer before he fell. Others have said that angel, the angel Gabriel is, is the angel who took Lucifer's place. We don't know that for sure, but that's just something to think about. But we know for sure here that the interpretation is true, that this male goat is the kingdom of Greece, and that the, the ram represents the kings of Media and Persia. And it says here, as for the broken horn and for the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. You know, essentially what Daniel is seeing in Daniel chapter 8, that vision, is a repeat of the four beast prophecy that he was given in Daniel chapter 7. Does that make sense? Are you seeing the similarities? It's the same time period being covered, but it's being done in a different way. And in Daniel chapter 8 the prophecy is being expanded a little bit more enlarge and expand it is a, a pattern that we see repeated oftentimes in scripture notice Daniel chapter 8 out of one of them these are the horns that Daniel saw out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south toward the east and toward the glorious land and it grew up to the host of heaven and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Have we seen this before? Yes, this is exactly the same power that was described in Daniel chapter 7. It's being described again in Daniel chapter 8. And why did we go over all this? Am I just trying to bore you to tears? Absolutely not, because we're, fixed. we're just about to discover something very exciting. Notice this, Daniel chapter 8 and verse 13. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? So Daniel hears two angelic beings talking to one another, and one of these angelic beings asks the question, how long is this oppressing power going to last? How long is it going to be before all the, the abominations that have been brought into the sanctuary, how long are those things going to remain? Is it going to last forever, or is it going to come to an end? I believe it's a very important question because Daniel wants to know the answer to this. Daniel 8, 14, And he said to me, For 
help me out here, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Daniel was told definitively that this oppressing power and all the abominations that had been brought into the sanctuary that, that brought God's anger, it was going to last for a period of, one th- of 2,300 days. This is the longest prophecy in Scripture, and we're going to take a look at this prophecy a little bit more closely tonight. But we're not going to know everything about this prophecy tonight because there's, there's a lot of information. And so it's going to happen on successive nights. And by the way, if you thought that tonight was the last night of the seminar, you are wrong. This is not the last night of the Operation Blueprint seminar. As a matter of fact, I have in my hand here tonight our extended schedule. Can you read that? Of course not. So you better get one of these on the way out tonight. They're actually going to be handing them out, okay? So we're going to continue. As a matter of fact, we have on our extended schedule another week or so. But that's not the end either. But it's only for for graduate students, okay? And I hope that all of you are graduate students tonight. You want to get your advanced degree in Bible prophecy. But this... This vision that of, of this power that was going to, to desecrate God's temple was going to last for 2,300 days. Now, we learned a few things about what days in Bible prophecy mean. What do days represent in Bible prophecy? One day in Bible prophecy equals what? One literal year. We found that out. Ezekiel 4.6 and Numbers 14.34. And it's a... It's a a method of interpreting Bible prophecy that has been understood and accepted for hundreds of years. And so here we have the 2300-year prophecy. Now, it's not hard to figure out. This prophecy has its beginnings at the very same time as the 70 weeks. And we understood that the 70 weeks started from the, the order or the decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. We know the exact year according to Ezra chapter 7 and verse 7 when that happened. It happened in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. So we know it happened in 457 BC. So all you have to do, you, all you have to do is take 2300 and subtract 457 and you end up with a date called what? Come on now. No, you're wrong. It actually comes out to 1843. But there's a problem, and we discovered how to fix that problem a couple of nights ago. Because when you go from B.C. to A.D., what happens? There's no zero year, which means we have to do what? Add an additional year. So it went from 1 B.C. to 1 A.D. And so then the math comes out right. It starts in 457 B.C., adding... If, you, if that is a minus, if you will, adding the 2300 takes us to 1843. We add the extra year. It takes us to the year 1844. Notice this. 2,300 days denote the whole time from the beginning of the vision to cleanse the sanctuary. The sanctuary is not yet cleansed, and consequently these years are not yet expired. This was written by Thomas Newton from the Church of England in what year? 1796 he recognized that when he lived there were still yet a couple of years to go notice what John Gill the Baptist scholar said these 2300 days may be considered as so many years which will bring it down to the end of the sixth millennium or thereabout when it may be hoped there will be a new face of things upon the sanctuary and the church of God and a cleansing of it from what all corruption in doctrine discipline worship and conversation he understood very clearly what the cleansing of the sanctuary was going to entail and he was hoping that the church would finally be purged of all the desecrations and all the distortions 
all the things that had been brought into the Christian church during the Dark Ages would be reversed by the end of the 2300-year prophecy. Notice this, Alexander Campbell. The question there proposed is, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifices and transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said to me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, as the Lord said to Ezekiel, I have appointed one day for a year, and as we find in symbolic language, one day stands for a year, we're at no loss in coming to the following conclusions. Notice what he says. From the going forth of the decree to rebuild Jerusalem to the baptism of Jesus was 483 years. His ministry was three and a half years or, in the, middle, or the middle of one week. Then he was cut off. We, we've already been over that prophecy. And in a half week, that is three and a half years, Christianity was sent to all nations. This completes the 70 weeks or 490 years of Daniel. Daniel then fixes the time of the nativity, the commencement of the kingdom, or the confirmation of the covenant, and the ultimate, notice this is the cleansing of the sanctuary, the ultimate cleansing of the sanctuary or purgation of the Christian church from anti-Christian, what? Abominations. This last event was to be 2,300 years from the aforesaid date. That is, from the birth of Jesus, about 1,847 years. And then he does the math, and he says it comes out to 1844. 1843, of course, but you have to add that extra year in. Well, during the Dark Ages or I should say toward the end of the Dark Ages and starting probably in the Middle Ages, there was light that was shining in a dark place. God had not forsaken his church. And God allowed individuals to see light and they started bringing light into the church. In the 1300s, John Wycliffe and his Lollards, those individuals who followed him, John Wycliffe translated the Bible from the Vulgate into a language that the people could understand because before that, the only scripture that was around was written in Latin, and, and the common man could not read Latin. It was a, a, a language, a, a skill that was only taught to those in university, and that was just about over most people's head, above their ability to do it. But they were persecuted as a cult. There was the 1500s, 14 and 1500s, Martin Luther, of course, giving us such a view of, of righteousness by faith, and he had... He had a saying. It was called sola scriptura. You know what that means? Only scripture. And of course, there was another saying, of course, sola fida, which means solely by faith. He understood this. But Martin Luther was persecuted as a cult, and those who followed them were, were oppressed. In the 1500s, John Calvin, the founder of Presbyterian, the light shone through him, but he was also persecuted as a cult. Then in the 1600s, John Smith and Roger Williams, the founder of the Baptist Church, brought light into God's church again, re rediscovering what had been lost about baptism. But they were persecuted as a cult. In the 1700s, John Wesley started the Methodist Church. Again, light was shining in a dark place. But did the church accept it? No, absolutely not. He was persecuted as a cult. And in 1844, the very end of the 2300 days, it was the birth date of the beginnings of the Seventh-day Adventist movement where more light was being shown in a dark place. Notice this. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church, this is the Catholic Church, ever did happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday the day of the Lord, Deus Domini, was chosen not from any direction noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventist and keep Saturday holy. This is from the church's writings. This is a Catholic writing. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has been privileged to understand many things that were brought to light during the Dark Ages. And this church is in existence today because individuals 
being drawn by the Holy Spirit and seeing the truth from God's word are following that and being true to that. Because God is merciful. It's not that we're smarter or better than anyone else, but God is good. For as the heavens is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Can you say amen to that? We stand under the mercy of God tonight. He shows mercies to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. But you know, the church has been persecuted, and Satan has not given up on persecuting the church. As a matter of fact, it says in Revelation chapter 12, but the woman was given two wings of an eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for, notice this, a time and times and a half time from the presence of the serpent. The serpent represents Satan and Satan's attempts to persecute and to stamp out the truth that is shining from God's word. But how are we to understand this prophecy in Revelation? Well, we have to apply what we know about Bible symbols. And it says in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 2, I have likened the daughter of Zion to what? A lovely and delicate woman. So in Bible prophecy, the, a woman represents what? The church. But notice what Satan did. And the dragon was enraged with the, help me out, with the, woman and the woman represents what in bible prophecy the church so the dragon who is satan was enraged with the church and he that is the dragon he went to make war with the rest of her offspring notice who satan is is singling out to focus his fury on is it people who are not following god's word People who are following their own hearts? Absolutely not. Notice this. He is focusing his fury on those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. I read a story a number of years ago. And there was this man who was very poor and he lived on the edge of the property of a very wealthy man. But it, this man, even though he was poor, he and his wife lived there. His kids were gone away, spending his last years in this little cabin on the edge of the rich man's property. And he worked, and worked as a caretaker, and he would uh, perform menial tasks for the man who owned the property. And one of the things that the rich man who lived in the beautiful home on the hill enjoyed doing was going duck hunting. And so this man would go out and go duck hunting and... Uh, he would take the old man with him, and, uh, and when he, would, he would actually have this guy go out and, and pick up the ducks that, that he shot, of course. And so the rich man, as they were going on a hunt one day, told the old man, he said, you know what? He says, you, you're a Christian, and, and you follow God, and, uh, you know, you try to honor God. And he says, look at you. He says, you know, you're getting old, and... You have no money. And he says, look at me. I don't believe in God at all. And uh, I'm just following my heart. And, and look, look what I have. I have all this money and I have all this freedom. And he said, that may be true. The old man said, that may be true. But you know, he says, you know, you don't, you don't send your dog out. Uh, when you shoot a duck, if the duck is there and he's dead, you don't really worry about going and picking up that duck because he's a dead duck. But you know, if that duck is still alive, he said, you quickly send me or you send the dog out to pick up that duck because you don't want that duck to get away. He says, you know what? He says, you've got all this easy life because Satan knows that you're a dead duck. But for me, I'm still alive and so Satan is after me. You know what? If you have any spiritual life in you tonight, Satan has you in the crosshair. Satan is looking to oppress you. He is looking to discourage you. He's looking for any way in which he can keep you from your walk of faith, from your relationship with Jesus Christ. But I'm so thankful that God is merciful. We see that Christ's mission began as the Lamb of God, right here, the altar of sacrifice. We see that Christ was baptized, represented by the laver, Christ had a 40-day conflict in the wilderness, and the conflict was over the word, it was over intercession, and it was over worship. 
Christ emerged out of the wilderness to preach the everlasting gospel. And notice this. And the New Testament church was birthed by the life and death of Jesus Christ. The New Testament church was baptized and received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. The New Testament church had a 1260-year conflict in the wilderness over, notice, the word, intercession, and worship. And the remnant church emerges out of the wilderness after the 1798, that's the end of the 1260-year period, to preach the everlasting gospel, that is, the three angels' messages. And we're going to be studying those three messages in detail on succeeding nights. Are you want to look forward to that? I'm excited as I look forward to sharing with you what God has revealed in the three angels' messages. This is what 1 John says. Now by this, we know that we know him if what? We keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments, that's God's commandments, is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly, the love of God is perfected in him. By this, we know that we are in him. It's very clear from Scripture that we do not gain salvation by keeping the commandments. We're saved by grace through faith. But when we enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, we desire to keep God's law, not to be saved, but because we are saved. Can you say amen to that? We love him because he first loved us. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments light is shining in a dark place in our own lives many times notice what Acts said truly these times of ignorance God overlooked but now commands what all men everywhere to do what repent what does repent mean to turn back it means to turn away from sin it means to turn toward God he commands everywhere to, men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this all by raising him from the dead. You know, we cannot be exposed to truth and just say, oh, that's nice. Because God through his mercy and grace, reveals truth to us. But when he reveals the truth to us, he expects us to make a decision based on the truth that has been revealed. And we need to decide tonight if we truly want to be under God's mercy. Blessed are they that do his commandments that so they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. And notice the, con the, the contrast here. Those who, who lovingly obey God, and they're on the inside of the city, but it says, for without or on the outside of that city wall, without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whoever loveth and maketh a lie. There's a sharp contrast between those who yield themselves fully to God's control and those who follow their own hearts. There are so many people tonight who are Doing it just like Frank Sinatra saying so many years ago, I did it, what? My way. But the wise man has told us there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but its end are the ways of death. We cannot follow our own way. We need to follow Jesus Christ through the sanctuary service because this is the promise that God makes to us. I love this. We're going to be looking at some of the things that God has prophesied in the book of Revelation. And there, there's going to be some horrific things that will happen before Jesus comes again. And, you know, sometimes our hearts really tremble. We're going, man, could I, could I make it through a time like that? Is my faith in Christ, is my commitment to Christ strong enough so that I will go through that time period? It's a good question to ask. But you know what? We can't really answer the question unless we know God's provision. Notice God's provision. Psalm 91. I love this. Read it tonight. Read it tomorrow. Read it every day. He who dwells in the what? Secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. When you come to God, 
You are under the shadow of the Almighty. That's where I want to be. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him I will trust. Surely, what will He do? He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees when He was going out of the temple for the last time? He says, how often, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stoned the prophets and killed those I've sent to you, he says, how often I wanted to gather your, chil your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. That is exactly a quote from Psalm 91. It says that he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. Can you say amen to that? That's where I want to be. When all the bad stuff is happening, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Can you say amen to that? It won't come near you. Only with your eyes you shall you look and see the reward of the wicked because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any, notice this, what? No plague come near your dwelling. We don't need to fear for the future because when we run to Jesus and when we ask Jesus to take us, he says, those who come to me, I will in no wise cast out. We are under the shadow of the Almighty, and no one touches us there. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If there's one thing that we need in this world in which we live, it's rest. Can you say amen to that? So much is going on around us, so much that we, is out of our hands, out of our control, so much that we worry about. But when we come to Jesus, we find rest. And I'm praying tonight that you will find the rest that Jesus makes available to you because we can believe his prophecy, but we have to do one thing. We have to get into the ark. We have to make a choice to align ourselves with God. We have to make a choice to open up our hearts to the door, our door of our hearts to Jesus Christ. Remember when the flood came and Noah said, this is the day to get in the ark. It was a day when the sun was shining and the birds were singing and the flowers were blooming. It was a beautiful day. And Noah said, today is the day to get in the ark. And so many people today are allowing God's mercy and God's grace to pass by. Get into the ark. And my question is we ask every night, are you under God's mercy tonight? We see that Baba prophecy has been fulfilled precisely. And, you know, we didn't really get into what does a cleansing of the sanctuary really, really mean? What happened? What is the significance of 1844? What happened? I mean, we passed the date. There was no loud bangs. There was no lightning from the sky. What happened? Tomorrow, we're going to investigate much more carefully what happened in the cleansing of the sanctuary at the end of the 2300-day prophecy. The title of tomorrow evening's presentation is called The First... Oh! Did I make a mistake? Wow. I was just testing you. No, I, I, I actually I, I messed up. And so thank you so much for correcting me. We're off tomorrow night. I'm amazed at, at your resilience. I'm amazed at your commitment because you've been here for six nights in a row. And I want to thank you for coming here night after night. We have one night off, but if you will come back on Friday evening, and I know there's going to be a meal at 6.30, remember that. If you come back on Friday evening, we're going to investigate much more carefully the first angel's message, which tells us exactly the significance of what happened, what began it was the end of the prophecy, but what, what happened? What, what did it kick off? What did it start? We're going to find out on Friday evening in the first angel's message of Revelation chapter 14. Please be here on Friday evening, and I will too, by the grace of God. May God bless you as you go tonight. Thank you so much for coming, and I will look forward to seeing you on Friday evening.
you go out. Copies of some of the quotes that I used in last evening's presentation. I have made copies. I don't have a ton of them because there's like maybe 15...